Hello and welcome to the Sonic Cinema Podcast. My name is Brian Scuttle. Thank you for joining me at www.sonic-cinema.com as well as the Sonic Cinema Podcast YouTube channel. Click subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple, Good Pods, YouTube, uh, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts, you can uh, click subscribe, rate, and review. It's always appreciated. You can also check me out at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. There you will find life soundtrack, leaving the collection, early access reviews, and more. And it's always a, uh, it's always kind of a grab bag. I'm still gradually starting to get leaving the collection and life soundtrack back on a regular basis, but hope to be doing that soon. That's at patreon.com backslash Sonic Cinema. So earlier this year, I began, I decided I wanted to continue a series that I did in 2019 uh, called Class of 1999, where I basically look at films from the 1999 movie year. Uh, This time, though, instead of the filmmakers, friends, and fellow critics that I had on before, I wanted to bring on some new voices whom I've gotten to know in the years since. And our guest today is certainly one of those. Uh, Robert Yass Jr. He's the producer of Crooked Tables Productions and uh, podcasts like Close Watch and Franchise Detours. Robert, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Brian. Thanks for having me. How How is everything going over at Crooked Table? I know Franchise Detours has been pretty busy this year. Franchise Detours this year has been pretty busy, yeah. So in 2024, we've done the Three Flavors Cornetto trilogy. We've done the the Elm Street films, which uh, share a director that we'll be talking about in a few minutes here. And uh, the Deadpools and the Rockies. So it's been a lot of fun over there. Close Watch has been uh, more on a hiatus. But I have, in the last year, since uh, the last time we talked, started a podcast with Darren Lundberg of Nostalgia Cast called Back to Bluey, where we talk about that anim- animated series. So that's been a lot of fun uh, and kind of a different different type of podcast than I'm uh, than I have a lot more experience doing. So definitely, people should check that out as well. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you and Darren are always fun to uh, talk to. What was it? What was it that uh, inspired you to to uh, start that podcast and discuss that series? Well, we're, you know, Darren and I are both dads, so we stumbled across the show in our own households. And then I think just had both of us saw, like, it, it resonated with both of us because we, we often talk about how that show is, is aspirational, how it, it, it kind of uh, shines a light on, you know, what it's like to be a parent and what it's like to be a kid and the, the, the complexities of that, time, that dynamic. And in seven minute chunks, it, it touches on these, like, profound themes and messages in a lot of in a lot of episodes and so just like half jokingly he was mentioned one time like oh we should do a bluey podcast and and i i i you know you don't dangle a good idea in front of me and not expect me to to jump <laughs> at it <laughs> so that kind of came a running thing so like so yeah so necessarily this blue seriously this bluey podcast like when is that happening um and and so we kind of from late 2022 up until like you know, I think December 2023 is when the show, when we do debut the first episode, uh, it was like a year kind of back and forth. All right, are we really going to do this? If we do, what would it be called? Well, if we want to do it right, we want to like personalize it. And so uh, it just took like, you know, one of those things simmering in the background while we, while life and other creative pursuits were ongoing that just sort of uh, came to fruition at just the right time. Because I feel like when our show debuted, it's, around the same time that that show sort of hit critical mass and it just like exploded in a in a way uh that we hadn't really seen before it was more of a a slow burn those first couple years like throughout the pandemic and then just like the latter half of last year early this year it's just now everywhere so is each episode a sort of an episode episodic uh review or how is the uh structure of that right podcast so normally we we talk about one episode of the show per episode of our show and we alternate who picks the episode so you know there's three seasons each season's like 
roughly 50 episodes. So there's 150 options on the table. We are, as of this recording, like the 20 something episode of the show because we release them bi-weekly. And so it's a Darren pick and then a Rob pick. And we've now this season, because we're in our second batch of episodes, so our season two, technically, we've started bringing in uh, guests. So we've had our first guest on at this point. We're looking at a couple other ones for this season. And those episodes are structured a little differently. It's just kind of getting a different perspective, what their the guest experience is with, with the show, what it means to them, what are some of the things that resonate with them particularly. But it's it's really like kind of dissecting each episode what what it has to say why it matters to us as parents and uh and, and it's been really fun it's it's been really you know those that show has a tendency to turn sort of heart-wrenching on a dime and so it's been really fun to to analyze the structure and the storytelling of that of those uh, of the series because the episodes are sort of multi-layered that if you're watching it just kind of as ambient background noise while you're you know while you're watching your kids it might not hit you the same way than if you give it a, a couple of rewatches like we normally do before we record an episode uh, and you kind of dig deeper. And so that's that's really been the purpose of each of our episodes. And it's been really fun and really positive experience so far. OK, excellent. Uh, yeah, check that out, especially if you're a uh, fan of the series. Um, and if you're a fan of uh, Robert and Darren in general, they're a couple of terrific podcasters. I always enjoy talking to them. And I'm really enjoying, I'm really looking forward to talking to you about today's movie, uh, which when I suggested having you on for Class of 99, I basically gave you a rundown of all the movies that we had already touched on in this series. And... Um, you gave me a couple that you wanted to do. And this was one that I was definitely interested in talking about because I actually haven't seen it in 25 years. It is Rennie Harlan's Deep Blue Sea with uh, Saffron Burroughs and Thomas Jane, Samuel L. Jackson, Michael Rappaport, L. O. Cool J., uh, Stone Skarsgård. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty wild movie. Uh, what what was it about this one that you wanted to talk about? And why did you pick it, I guess I should say? <laughs> yeah, so there are, I, I, I'm pretty sure I might have seen this in theaters. I'm not 100% on that, but I definitely, this is one of like three DVDs that were the first DVDs that I ever, that I ever got. It was this, Man on the Moon, which I've covered on... Uh, Close Watch, what used to be the Crooked Table podcast, and uh, Martin Lawrence's Blue Streak. And that was like, those were the first DVDs I owned that I remember owning. I'm sure The Matrix was in there somewhere as well. And, uh, you know, that technology at the time blew my mind. Like, the trailer and the music video and the making of, like, all this stuff in one place. Because as people that grew up with mostly VHS in your house in their households will remember that was not the case it was you got the movie and that's about it you have to deal with tracking and all that other stuff be kind rewind so the dvd technology uh this movie really kind of is the the foundation for uh for me in that regard plus this is also the kind of movie that i saw a lot like growing up with uh with my family like we watched a lot of comedies we watched a lot of like action thriller movies and that was like Happy Gilmore was on a lot in our house. Uh, the like Stallone and Schwarzenegger movies were on a lot growing up. So this is like as a sci-fi action thriller. This is like right in the wheelhouse of the kind of thing I I grew up watching. And it had been a while since I've seen it as well. Uh, it's probably been at least at least fifteen years or so since I've watched it. And it's I I remembered it being really kind of a fun, interesting take on it. And like you mentioned, like and it really. A surprisingly stacked cast now going back and watching it. Well, I mean, I, I feel like that's probably the Rennie Harlan part of it because, um, you know, he, he directed Die Hard 2. He directed uh, One of the Nightmare on Elm Street, as you said. Yep. Uh, he also directed The Long Kiss Goodnight, which I think was his uh, previous film to this one, which even though it wasn't a huge hit financially speaking, it certainly gained a cult following over the years and it's a fantastic film um so yeah i mean i i think rain harlan might have been part of it 
I, but I mean, I, I think to a certain extent, you're also looking at some of these actors starting to being cast sort of at the right time in their careers. Absolutely. Like, I mean, you know, this was post Pulp Fiction, post Jurassic Park, Samuel Jackson, you know, right as he's going into Star Wars as Mace Windu the exact same summer. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, Thomas Jane was somebody who was kind of on the way up. I mean, he was a few years away from being the Punisher, but he had already done some bit roles and stuff like that. So he's he was getting up there. LL Cool J, obviously, highly successful rapper in the 90s. Rappaport, a uh, terrific character actor. Stone Skarsgård was starting to get notice. This was after... Um, the uh, version of Insomnia that he was in before Chris Nolan's remake. And um, it was also after Breaking the Wave. So I, I think in that respect, you have a lot of context to why this cast is the way it is. But also, like, with the exception of Samuel L. Jackson, none of these guys are overly well-known actors or right. really major stars at this point. And I, I think, you know, this type of movie, it's this, the premise of this movie is pure B-movie shock, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's an absurd premise. <laughs> like, so the scientist is studying sharks that they've genetically modified to see if their brains have the right makeup to cure Alzheimer's. Yep. That sounds like a must bag. That is an insane <laughs> premise for a movie. And I will say, I do love that they kind of acknowledge that in, in the movie. Yeah. Um, I, you know, it's like, I, I think this, I will admit, I, I'm not a huge fan of this movie. I, uh -huh. I recognize that it's goofy, but, and it has some fun stuff. It, I will say I'm glad I rewatched it because of yeah. the fact that remind me of what I liked about it. And also it's like, okay, there's some pretty decent stuff in this movie. I'm not gonna lie. Yeah. Um, the one thing I will notice about this movie is that it, Harlan just does not let up with the pacing. In this movie, it moves very efficiently for an hour fifty minute movie. Yeah, yeah, it does, and and I love that that you mentioned in context of Samuel Jackson's career, Jurassic Park, because this is in very much in in a lot of ways sort of a a B movie Jurassic Park clone, but with sharks instead of dinosaurs. In a lot of respects, like rewatching it now is like, oh, this is. So Thomas Jane is a proto Owen Grady before Jurassic World happened. Mm. Only he was training sharks instead of raptors. And so it, it's like on the scale of B movie blockbuster entertainment, like it feels perfectly at home midway through Samuel L. Jackson's filmography between Jurassic Park and Snakes on a Plane. Like right. it's like right in that middle ground. It's like playing it like grounded enough, but also kind of being, but also leaning into the ridiculousness of its premise, like you said. Uh, yeah, it's, you have the Saffron Burroughs character as sort of the anti-hero slash villain of the piece, kind of the John Hammond. So yeah. it's, so there's a lot of well, that going as, on as well here. It's, it's interesting about her character because I, I think, I think anti-hero is a good way of, uh, yeah. describing her character because I think she has it's it's weird because of the fact that I think she has good intentions sure it's just the way she's going about them is completely deranged like absolutely like no but why you would do this at all makes no sense to me whatsoever um well they give her yeah, a backstory I, I, that like she's yeah. witnessed I'll say Alzheimer's firsthand so that's we're supposed to be like oh okay oh yeah you know we well, everybody that's... gets their tragic backstory in this movie essentially <laughs> well that's why i think and that's why i feel like calling her the anti-hero as opposed to straight up villain yeah is appropriate because of the fact that it's like 
she has decent intentions and she has understandable motivations for why she would want to do this. Sure. It's just the way that she's going about it is completely uh, batshit crazy. <laughs> um, you know, and, and I'm, you know, and obviously Jurassic Park, you can obviously make a, make a beeline from that one to this. And I, I think, I think that is a great, uh, comparison, but obviously we've got to talk about the, the mother of all shark movies, Jaws. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's funny that, you know, this and open water a few years later, it's funny that people continue to make franchises out of killer shark movies. Yeah. And it's like, did you not learn from Jaws? <laughs> Jaws the Revenge, Jaws 3D. Like, yeah. Now, exactly. now I mean what we'll, now I mean what we'll say is that at least these movies, at least at least Deep Blue Sea, from what I've gathered, kind of goes this slasher route. And it's mm -hmm. not just recycling the same characters over and over, right. like uh, Jaws did, which was one of its big issues. Um, but no, I mean, it, it's funny. And, you know, Samuel L. Jackson's death in this movie is just absolutely one of the most iconic deaths of the 1990s. Absolutely. And it's funny because of the fact that I started thinking about it. And to me, I wonder if Rennie Harlan, when he was thinking about how to stage that sequence he's like okay Spielberg didn't have the guts to show Samuel L. Jackson just eviscerated by a <laughs> velociraptor we're gonna show him get eaten by a shark and then the, the two most sharks and then the two yeah. sharks like converge and and pull his head off I think to like they're like rip yeah. it and rip him in half yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's it's insane um I don't know it fits more insane than Stone Skarsgård's death in this movie right I, but it's not far off because of the fact that he, he, he's been injured. So they're trying to get him out. The helicopter is lost. So he goes underwater and then he gets attacked by the sharks. And then the sharks smack him into the glass. Well, they're smart sharks. They, uh, and, and they've been enhanced. And, Somehow he's still kind. It still seems like he's alive when that's happening. Yeah, I think he's got an oxygen tank on or something. I guess something like that. But it's like, what? <laughs> this is. And here's here's the thing that I do appreciate on on rewatch is that there are some absolutely insane kills in this movie, mm -hmm. and I like that in the same way I appreciate a good cheesy slasher movie. Right. Because of the fact that it's like, look, I know I'm not going to get high art out of this. I know I'm not going to get a great movie out of this. Just kill the cannon fodder in a decent way. Right. I mean, you know, at least kill, kill them in an interesting way. And I might actually go along with this movie to a certain extent. Uh -huh. did, did, did it satisfy you in that way? Like, do you think the kills live up to uh to that criteria oh yeah definitely okay. yeah i mean the the samuel jackson one obviously is infamous uh but i mean i had forgotten about this stone scars guard one and that was hilarious to watch um you know and then you you have the moment where some of the team is separated and you know most of them are together and then you've got ll cool j is the chef He's in his own movie for half of he's this. He's basically too. in his own movie, and he's 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 got this pair with him. Yeah, and he's <laughs> he's determined to keep this pair safe. And I'll be honest, LL Cool J is my favorite character in the entire movie. Hundred percent. He, he he understands the assignment when it comes to this movie completely. Yes, and um. I I you I knew he was my favorite character when I first watched it. I was just reinforced how much I enjoyed his character in this movie on rewatch. Like I if the movie had just been about him fighting a shark, I I think I would have been down for it. <laughs> <laughs> it's almost like I can imagine an earlier version of this movie where it was Thomas Jane and Saffron Burroughs at the end 
But then test yeah. screenings be like, no, 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 you can't kill off LL Cool J. You got yeah. to make sure he stays alive, <laughs> especially, you know, he has that that meta line sort of similar to Scream 2 of, oh, brothers never make it out of situations like this. Um, oh, yeah, exactly. Things like that. Like you have to, you can't then follow suit with that. Um, I, I like that you meant, obviously you mentioned Jaws earlier, and the, I think this movie gets that out of the way pretty fast. Like we have that yeah. scene on the boat where the, you know, this, the, the, we have a group of people like hanging out and partying and you have the, the red wine spilling into the water to sort of, sort of looks like blood and it's very sort of slashery vibes right out the gate and it ends up sort of being a, a red herring like they, they nobody gets killed off in that in that um, beginning scene. Then you have the license plate that's that's removed from the shark uh, earlier in the movie and John, Thomas Jane hands it to uh, Samuel L. Jackson. I, I felt that that was this movie sort of like, yeah, yeah, we know. We've all seen Jaws. We have sharks in our movie. We're not doing that. We're doing something a lot yeah. less serious and more playful. Did you did you feel that was Rennie Harlan's intent, and and did that come across? Because I that's the way I've always read that. I you know I I think the opening definitely I I do think has Jaws vibes, and I think it yeah. really does play into slasher tropes as well. Sure. Just because of the fact that it's younger younger group of characters and stuff like that. And they're behaving like idiots, like a lot of people in slashers do. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I do think that that's definitely the intent. And plus, I mean, Rennie Harlan as a veteran of horror, as a veteran of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise, he would understand why those tropes were. Absolutely. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I do think that was... I do think that was a good choice. And I do like that, you know, as much as obviously Jaws is a progenitor of this movie, I do think the more I think about it, the more Jurassic Park makes the most sense. Yes. Because it's corporate greed versus medical research versus, you know, greed versus science. And, you know, you got that in Jurassic Park, you know, versus what you get here. Now, granted, the science in this movie is inherently ridiculous. Um, As a side effect, the sharks got smarter. You're like, oh, sure. Yeah, because of, of course. course they did. Um, you know, because, you know, what 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 more do you want to, what, what is a good idea? Oh, yeah, we're going to uh, make the most dangerous predators in, on, on Earth smarter. Yeah. And so, like, As yeah, you do. Okay. <laughs> As, as one is one to do for scientific research. There, there's also uh, just, all the... Just, yeah, go ahead. Just to see what happens. Yeah, you know? yeah. There's also all the talk of playing God in this movie. There's the whole... Yeah. And they lay that on really thick. LL Cool J has, is, like, praying throughout, and every time, you know, uh, there's a scene where, like, Michael Rappaport or something, like, it curses are about something or whatever, and he's like, oh, he always answers, that kind of thing. And then Stellan Skarsgård has the whole speech about, like, oh, you know... Uh, no, not his, ours, like our creation, like, mm -hmm. you know, that we've kind of taken over essentially. And so I think that's also very, very Jurassic Park. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. very much so. Um, you know, and uh, I I love the gigantic cross that LL Cool J's character has. I mean, that's, that's just such a great touch for his character, I think. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, I do think you know, this this movie, I will admit, I enjoyed it more this time than I did yeah. the first time. I, I really did. So I'm glad I appreciate it for what it is. And, uh, you know, I mean, part of that is 25 years of movie watching where it's like, I have a better understanding of what I appreciate. I have a better understanding that some movies are just designed to be ridiculous yeah. and fun. Exactly. And this is I mean... This, this is, is like a mid, mid, mid budget, like action thriller. When do you see that? You know, not and everybody on film Twitter is like, oh, this, those Pirates of the Caribbean movies, they make today's blockbusters look like, you know, like how things have aged and looking back at an earlier time in, in yeah. Hollywood history. And this movie, you know, cost, I think, like 70, 80 million and mm -hmm. is like mid budget, the CGI, it, it ages okay. How do you feel about the effects in this? I feel like they're solid for, for how old they are. Like they're not terrible, but they're not great. They're just kind of sufficient. 
Yeah, I mean, I would agree yeah. with that. I mean, the yeah. visual effects don't hold up whatsoever, but I do think to a certain extent that part of its charm. Yes, absolutely. I, I do think, you know, and the thing is, it's like, you you see all the time, like, there, there are filmmakers, there are other people who are like, oh, I want to touch up the effects. No, no, no. Don't touch up the effects. <laughs> the The reason those effects work is because they were the state of the art or they were what you decided to do at the time. And I think especially for the tone that this movie captures, which is, you know, a much higher budget sharp note, NATO essentially. Right. Um, I, I think this, you know, the effects work, the effects are yeah. entertaining. And so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think they work well for the, the way the story is being told. Even just like the basics of storytelling conventions, like I feel like this movie ha does that pretty well. You have Jacqueline McKenzie as Jan early in the in the film, explain like giving all this exposition of like, yeah. oh, we're underground and the three levels and blah 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 blah. How all of this mm -hmm. works at Aquatica and all of that. Like it's it really lays the stakes, the geography of the space that they're in. All of that. Like Rennie Harlan is it has always been a pretty solid action director, and I think that kind of stuff really helps orient to audiences so that when the chaos is happening, you'd be like, oh my God, that's right. There are three levels down. There's this many yeah. sharks and like all the basics, you don't have to worry about it. Once the chaos starts happening, it's just like you were saying, it just goes, it's go, go, go. They're just running around in water. I kept thinking watching it this time, like how, how horrible this shoot must have been for these actors because they're just in like hallways full of water like week yeah. after week. I'm just like, gosh, that must have been exhausting. Oh, no doubt. No, no doubt. I mean, you know, I, I think, I think your description of Rennie Harlan as a filmmaker is appropriate. I, yeah. I think he's a solid filmmaker. I, I don't think he is a particularly great filmmaker. I think when he had decent material, when he's had decent material, he can deliver a solid movie. I, I think Long Kiss Goodnight is a good, good example of that. I think mm -hmm. Cliffhanger is a good example. Cliffhanger is a perfectly strong action movie. Um, you know, yes, it's got that iconic scene at the very beginning that, and then the rest of it is kind of what it is. But ultimately, I think that movie works. And, um, you know, Long Kiss Goodnight had a much sought after screenplay by Shane Black. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it just works like a charm. And, it's because it's such a great premise. And, you know, I mean, even with Die Hard 2, I mean, he, he's a filmmaker who, you know, he, he understood what that movie needed. And it, it didn't need somebody who's going to try to put their personal stamp on it. He needs somebody to do a sequel to one of the most successful action movies of all time. And right. he did that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what do we think of, what do we, I mean, we've talked about LL Cool J. I mean, I know he's far and away my favorite of the cast. Uh, what do you, what do you think about the cast in general for this movie? I think it's really solid. I, I really like all of these uh, actors in here. I really, I think the characters are, you know, they fall right into those type of archetypes that you would, you would hope for in a movie like this. You have the one guy, Michael Rappaport, that knows everything about how the whole facility works. Obviously you have the LL Cool J as preacher, the chef who's so removed. He's like, I don't understand all that science stuff. Here's my legacy, the perfect omelet, which is made with two eggs, not three. <laughs> and um, I really like Thomas Jane. I think he's really fun in this. And this is, it feels like this was the movie that led him directly to the Punisher. Like he has a similar kind of energy already in this film. So I, I like that my two favorite characters are the ones that survive to the end um, because I, I think that they have really fun chemistry by that uh, in the climax of the film. Yeah, Thomas Jane is somebody who I, I think he, he kind of goes unheralded to a yeah. certain extent and it's a shame because I, I think he always brought, has brought something to, to films and I, I do agree with you. I, I think he's I think he's solid here. I mean, I, I think he understands the archetypes that he's playing. I think he 
understands the tropes that he's playing. And I I do like that he 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 seems he seems to be like the other actor in the cast who really kind of understands the tone that this movie is going for. Right. And uh no, I I, I think he's I think he's good in this movie. He's going for like um, a snake Pliskin sort of vibe with his yeah. attitude. Just like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like shady past. Like straight to the point, no bullshit, and and yeah, it's he's he's got really you know he's got the physicality in this movie as well, all of that. It's I'm looking at his filmography now, and I'm like, that's right, he's been stuck in like direct to VOD land for yeah. years, which is a real bummer because he he should have been he should be doing much more and much bigger things after you know, especially after movies like The Mist, which he's really great in that as well. Oh God. Yeah, um, which I feel like shows up like every few weeks uh, in my feed. I'm like, oh, don't show me this again. It's like, you know, you have this, those prompts online. They're like, oh, most yeah. devastating, you know, final scene. And it, that's always the one everybody says. Um, uh, but yeah, I feel like it was he, it, it, there's him. There's and like uh, Aaron Eckhart has a kind of a similar energy. So I feel like they like, yeah. canceled each other out at a certain point. Because in the like mid late two thousands, they were both sort of popping, and then just mm-hmm. faded off into the uh, into the ether in different directions, which is which is uh, you know a shame, I think. Yeah, I mean, and I I think I feel like probably, and I mean, the comparison to Eckhart is probably a good good uh, a good one um, because of the fact that I mean, Aaron Eckhart is you know he he has that kind of mold as far as the same type of character actor. Right. But I I think he just ended up getting the better chances and mm-hmm. working with the better directors. Like the next year he was doing he was working with uh well he was working again with Neil LeBute and uh Nurse Spade, but he was also in Aaron Brockovich mm-hmm. too. And uh obviously by 2008 he was in The Dark Knight. But um but yeah I mean I I think it's 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 interesting. It's fascinating to see the way character actors' careers go and how some take off and some don't. And it's it's really kind of. I mean, I don't know. It's it's just. I mean, I I think I know it has a following now, but like the Punisher, I don't think did him necessarily any favors, right? Because I mean, it was it was still them trying to. It was still studios trying to do a Marvel movie without Marvel's right. input, and really, with the exception of X-Men and Spider-Man, as we've kind of talked about, nobody was really gang it at the time. It was I mean, strange times. It was strange times for Marvel. Like, yeah, you had yeah. the the Sony with Spider-Man, Fox had Fantastic Four, Daredevil. I mean, everybody who's referenced in Deadpool and Wolverine, basically, right. all of those guys. <laughs> um and then uh, New Line with Blade, and then Punisher was with Lionsgate of all places. Yeah. And then even when they did the sequel, they just, you know, they brought uh, they brought in Ray Stevenson instead of uh, instead of Thomas Jane and like rebooted it again. So I don't know. I'm also I'm also based in Tampa, Florida, which is where the Punisher in 2004 is uh, was shot and is set. So that was a big deal to be like, hey, I know that area. I drove by. by well, I can't all the imagine. Time. That was that yeah. doesn't happen a lot in Tampa. So that was a big mm-hmm. deal. Like at the beginning of that movie, they flash on the screen like Tampa, Florida. People are cheering in the theater because they're like, hey, it's our city <laughs> represented. So I think between uh, the Punisher and Deep Blue Sea, like I've always have a little bit of a soft spot for Thomas Jane when he shows up. Yeah. Yeah. No, I and I mean, you know, it, as it. See, what did let me, let me try to bring it up here? Let's see what else, if anything. Okay, so I mean, oh well, NCIS LA was, and basically, and NCIS has been uh, LL Cool J's main thing in the past twenty five years. Yeah, he went from LA to Hawaii in that series. Nice. Uh, he was in Last Holiday with Queen Latifah. Yeah, um, and LL Cool re- J has been everywhere. That's he's one of those yeah. guys that just exists in the ether. 
He's yeah. one of those rappers that is has whose personality has transcended hip hop music, like in the way that Snoop Dogg always pops up everywhere. And you're like, yeah, what is Snoop Dogg doing here? Oh, of course he is. Oh, hello, <laughs> Cool J's just become one of those guys, like you know, uh, host television personality and like hosting the Grammys and like lip sync battle and all these different things, like all over the place. And, and I think you know more power to him for having that kind of versatility, like. He's definitely not somebody who like, whatever happened to LL Cool J? Like, he's on four different things this week. What are you talking about? Yeah, I mean, and, and it's funny because I'm actually, for, I've, I actually forgot about a lot of these credits. I forgot he was in Any Given Sunday, forgot he was in Charlie's Angels, forgot he was in Rollerball, uh, SWAT, Mindhunters reuniting with Rennie Harlan, not the David Fincher Netflix series. Right. Um, and then, I mean, last holiday, that was, yeah, that was Wayne Wang. I mean, that was, that, he's not a pretty significant uh, indie filmmaker. I mean, you know, so he he clearly, people clearly recognize that yeah. he had talent. And, you know, yeah, I mean, he, you, you see him in TV. I mean, he's definitely leaned into more... Uh, it seems like he's led more into uh, some hard-boiled roles as opposed to comedic roles, which is a shame because I, he does he delivers a really good joke in this movie, um, really good jokes in these movies. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't realize he'd been on NCIS so long. So yeah, yeah, that's where that's where a lot of his time's been spent the past 15, 20 years. But uh, no, I mean, I'm I'm glad that I'm glad that I ended up having a reason to rewatch this because of the fact that it's like I I may not I may not I may not love it, but yeah. I I enjoyed watching it, and I I think that was that's sometimes that's that's not a bad thing. Like realizing that it's like a movie is not great, a movie is ridiculous. But it was it was fun to revisit it. So yeah, and it and it turned a profit. Like it 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 made I think worldwide double its budget. So it it did yeah. well enough. It was a solid hit. I just adm admire now looking at the the sequels, the straight to video sequels that followed. Like the uh, the restraint that we didn't they did there was they didn't squeeze out a Deep Blue Sea two until twenty eighteen. And then Deep Blue Sea 3 in 2020, obviously in kind of in name only sequels, I imagine. Right. Just like other people also studied and messed with sharks and <laughs> sharks got well, loose. Well, I mean, it, it's it's the same reason so many yeah. sequels get made where it's like, oh yeah, we're going to just, you know, we're, we're just going to go by this. I, we're just going to go use this IP because people might right. remember it and stuff like that. I can't uh, yeah. imagine those are any good, the sequels. I mean, oh, I'm I can't at, imagine either. I'm seeing here that Deep Blue Sea 3 has a decent, like, approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Read into that whatever you will, but it's like, I would think it would be, like, not, you know, critically reviled type of stuff. So who knows? Yeah. Who knows? I haven't, I can't speak to the sequels, um, but I do know that mm -hmm. I can't imagine they have a, a filmmaker like Rennie Harlan behind it who can, like, make this ridiculous movie you know <laughs> like hold it together in the, yeah. in the right no, way no i, Where, I can't, so i can't imagine it either um yeah now now that you've now i got you got me thinking about this who are the filmmakers between these two Let's see deep blue sea darren scott i've never heard of him deep blue oh okay he's a, he's one of those he he's he's somebody who's done more producing. Well, he's done fair, he's done fair amount as director. What has he done? I mean, a lot of TV, a lot of videos. Yeah, that's to your point. Not nearly the uh, talent that or well known as Freddie Rennie Arlen is. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, John Pogue did three. Okay, so he's, he's got some decent decent scripts to his name. Uh, U.S. Marshals, well, he did the Rollerball screenplay, which, okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> I mean, I've heard decent things. I've heard decent things about Ghost Ship, 
So, I mean, there, there's a couple of things there that are all right. Yeah. Oh, he did a sequel to Eraser. Yeah, I'm seeing that. that. Probably seems like another in name only sequel. Exactly. Because, <laughs> uh, yeah, who the heck barely remembers that Arnold Schwarzenegger film? <laughs> I remember it. Charles I do Ra- too. But Chuck Russell, yeah. a director yeah. of the third Elm Street. As opposed to Rennie Harlan directed the fourth Elm Street. There's a, there's a little bit. Yeah. It's a small world. All these Elm Street mm-hmm. filmmakers circle around each other. But yeah, no, I mean, to, to your point, it's like they seem like they're in name only sequels just to kind of cash in what cachet the IP has. Yeah. I mean, it's like, you know what? We're, we're not going to try to sell this as an original idea. We're just going to package it as a sequel. And it's yeah. like, okay, whatever. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, I, I, I think Deep Blue Sea is, yeah, I, I, I think it's funny because of the fact that you you think 99, obviously, you think about the significant films. You think about The Matrix, you think about Fan Mess, you yeah. think about being John Malkovich, uh, Man on the Moon, like you mentioned earlier. Not Blue Sixth Street. Sense. <laughs> Blue Not Street. Blue Street. I mean, Blue Martin, Street was Martin. an entertaining movie. Um, so, I mean, you, you've got some entertaining movies there. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, it's like, I, I think one of the things that was interesting, this wasn't even the only, like, giant, you know, water predator movie of 99, because Lake Placid also came out, I think, oh, that's right. I think the same <laughs> month. I mean, that Maybe. was a giant alligator. But it sure was. it's, but yeah, I mean, it's, the the thing I like about the 90s, and especially, you know, and even the early 2000s is you still had enough variety of like the types of movies like you you mentioned the you you mentioned the budget this was a fairly mid budget movie mm-hmm. now like you wouldn't necessarily right. make this movie for 70 million dollars now like right. it would be 100 million at least and you'd be like what are you doing with that <laughs> but um but no, I, I like the fact that you had all these kind of mid-tier movies where um where just it 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 doesn't pretend to be anything more than it is. Mm-hmm. I think that's what ultimately wins me over with this movie. Yeah. And it's also in the pantheon of of uh killer shark movies, obviously Jaws. But then what else? Like where would you where would you put this with the likes of, you know, the Meg, the Shallows, Open Water, things like that? I would say, I mean, I, I would say it's comparable to the Meg. I mean, the Meg is, I mean, again, the Meg is a movie that understands exactly what it is. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's giant sharks and just absolutely bat crap crazy action. Um, Shallows, Open Water is I think a is different actually, kind of movie. Now that open I realize it. Very, open water is almost found footage in a way. Yeah. It it tries to be found fo- it's 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 sort of riding off of that Blair Witch project type formula. Mm-hmm. And so yeah, it's a really interesting experiment in there. I I like the first open water, but yeah, um you? I mean I would say this would be up there with like the Meg and I mean the Shallows is a decent one. I mean even 40 seven meters below i think is it or 47 meters down is is an okay shark movie as well yeah i mean yeah i i think it's basically jaws and then everything else is just, <laughs> well of course eh, it's okay i mean <laughs> but i feel like if, clu- if you're doing jaws by way of jurassic park it's pretty much delivers i think on, yeah, on that yeah 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 i mean i think if you're i, I think if you're gonna splice those two uh Spielberg movies together. I mean, I think this is probably as good of an example of that as you can get. I had to imagine that was the log line when some somebody pitched this to somebody and they were like, Jaws meets Jurassic Park, and someone's like just saw dollar signs. Green oh, yeah, light. absolutely. Make it. And this is what we get. And luck- <laughs> luckily, you know, like I said, the 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 actors are are game and pretty charismatic across the board. Uh, it, it moves at a decent pace. The kills are solid. 
And like you said, is it the best movie in the world? No, but it's like, that's the thing with 1999, as you alluded to. Like, there are the game-changing movies where there was a seismic shift in cinema. And then there's the ones that feel very much like 1999, like a 90s, like, action, sci-fi, horror, thriller kind of um, mashup, which is basically what this is. And I, there's something, I guess to me, there's something comforting in that, in a way, in a movie that I have long-standing personal kind of ties to as far as uh you know moving into dvd market and building my physical media collection and all of that uh so yeah that's that's it's a, it was a it's a fun watch it's a fun one to put on not particularly yeah. deep but i definitely recommend if people haven't seen it to check it out for sure oh no definitely yeah yeah i mean it's on i know it's on max that's how i watched it recently and uh yeah i mean it's 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 a fun watch just you know and the funny thing is it's like i at first i was like eh, i mean ray harlan's not really doing much of anything with this material he's not really directing it he, he's not really bringing a whole lot of style to it. and then as the movie progresses as the kill starts to happen with the scientists as you start to whittle it down in that slasher form it's like mm -hmm. okay yeah he he's he's gang he he's 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 <laughs> delivering what you want him to deliver here yeah. and so no it was it's it was it was a lot of fun to watch and, um, and it's pretty small in scale too they they really they establish up front oh everybody's going home we have a skeleton crew on the weekend so you yeah. have like your <laughs> like half dozen characters and that's you know and the you know the lady brenda in the tower who gets taken yeah. out by the helicopter <laughs> um, all of that yeah yeah so it's it does feel sort of like a a Jurassic Park feels is is more expansive. It's more like Jurassic Park meets Jaws meets Alien because they are yeah. in a relatively confined space with these yeah. creatures. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, no. I mean, it's 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 a fun watch. It's you know, it's worth checking out if uh, you like cheesy. Cheesy shark movies, cheesy horror movies, cheesy sci-fi movies with absolutely insane science. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, it was. I'm I'm glad I got. You. I'm glad I had the opportunity to rewatch it. Um, well, Robert, as we uh, wrap things up, uh, where can people find you? Yeah, you can find uh, my Crooked Table shows, Franchise Detours, and Close Watch wherever you get your podcasts, uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Good Pods, uh, and other podcatchers, as well as crookedtable.com. And you can find Back to Bluey on all those same, uh, all those same podcatchers, as well as uh, you can find Crooked Table on Twitter, Instagram, and threads at Crooked Table, and at Back to Bluey on Facebook and Instagram. Okay, excellent. Well, Robert, thank you very much, as always, for joining me. It's always a pleasure to talk to you and uh, looking forward to doing it again in the future. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian. This is a blast. I'd like to thank Robert for joining me on the podcast today. It was always good to talk to him and uh, look for him again later on in the year for more Class of 1999. That's going to be it for this Sonic Cinema podcast this episode. I uh, got some exciting episodes coming up soon my annual dragon con episode uh going to be looking back at the clerks franchise and uh got a lot more of interesting uh discussions on the way once again subscribe link and like and review wherever you listen to podcasts uh check us out at patreon.com backslash sonic cinema as well as www.sonic-cinema.com. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.